The Newtonian Lucretius by Monsieur Lesage Translated by C. G. Abbott This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Quote, in all branches of knowledge, the earliest systems are too limited, too narrow, too timid, and it would even seem that the prize of truth is only won by a certain audacity of reason. End quote. Fontanelle, in Eulogy of Cassini. The aim of this memoir. I propose to show that if the earliest Epicureans had possessed as just ideas on cosmography as those of several of their contemporaries, which they neglected, and but a portion of the knowledge of geometry which had then been attained, they would in all probability have easily discovered the laws of universal gravitation and its mechanical cause, laws whose discovery and demonstration are the greatest glory of the mightiest genius that has ever lived, and cause whose comprehension has long been the object of ambition of the greatest physicists and is now the stumbling block of their successors. Such things, for example, as the famous Kepler's laws, discovered scarcely two centuries ago, and founded in part upon gratuitous conjectures, and in part upon tedious gropings, would have been nothing but special inevitable corollaries of the general knowledge which the ancient philosophers could easily draw from nature's own mechanism. This conclusion is entirely applicable to Galileo's laws on falling bodies, whose discovery has been still slower and more contested. Moreover, the experiments by which this discovery was established were so crude that they left the way open to interpretations which rendered them equally compatible with several other hypotheses which were in fact urged against him. On the other hand, the consequences of the theory of atomic collisions would have been unequivocally in favor of the sole right interpretation, equal accelerations in equal times. The union of the several branches of this conclusion forms not only a philosophic truth of extreme interest, but one from which a very useful consequence may be drawn, which is that in spite of the greater weight due to a posteriori researches, a priori ones are not to be wholly neglected, since they may greatly accelerate the success of the former. Already some impartial philosophers are agreed that such conjectures, if lucid and capable of evaluation, might be useful to the most rigorous physicists, were it only in suggesting to them definite points of view from which to direct experiment, in the place of that indecision in which the mere vague wish for new investigation has often left them. Let us clearly understand that such speculation is only permissible for the sake of occupation when the skill and patience which new observation and experiment require are lacking. We ought to be thoroughly informed as to all previous observations and experiments on the subject, and to keep this steadily in view in forming hypotheses, which are to be tested by them with the aid of every help that mathematics can give in examining as to the exactness of their agreement. Finally, it is such an agreement, rather than any elaboration of method, which brings conviction to most students of any physical theory, and this, whether they are aware of this agreement before their acquaintance with these methods, or whether a study of the method led them to the agreement. 1. If the disciples of Epicurus had been as fully persuaded of the sphericity of the earth as they were of its flatness, then instead of conceiving their atoms to move in nearly parallel paths, as was suited to a directive force perpendicular to a plane surface, they would undoubtedly have attributed to their motion normal to the surface of a sphere, and consequently directed at all points towards its centre. An example of such a condition, as I have in mind, would be furnished if it hailed simultaneously in all the countries of the earth. 2. The following objection would of course have been raised by some to this view. Part of these atoms must necessarily encounter the moon before reaching the earth, and by their pelting would push her toward us. And on the other hand, the force exerted upon those terrestrial objects which she shields would be less because of her interposition. 
consequently we ought to see the moon descending and a part of the waters of the ocean rising to meet her as if rendered lighter by the interception of the atoms and consequently yielding their place to the adjacent waters in view of these objections the epicureans would have had to see if some phenomenon of this nature did not really exist they would have answered their opponents that the moon did not recede from us on a tangent but really did approach the earth at each instant and that the alternating motions of the ocean so accordant with those of the moon exhibited this very effect in question due to the inequality introduced in the stream of atoms by the interposition of this great body three the example of a pebble projected horizontally which circulates for a few moments about the earth before falling and longer in proportion as the motion is more rapid would have made it clear that the moon which occupies but a month in such a great journey might not of necessity actually approach the earth except in the sense of being nearer than if she had gone off on a tangent four a persistent antagonist fortified by some theorems of centrifugal force similar to those of huygens which are easily demonstrated by elementary geometry for polygonal orbits such as would result from intermittent collisions might further have objected that the motion of the moon was still sixty times too slow to prevent her actual approach to us taking into consideration the very considerable force of gravitation found at the surface of the earth upon this the epicureans would not have been slow to reply that since the distance from the moon to the centre of our globe is sixty times as great as our distance from this same centre the spherical surface having the radius of the moon's orbit is thirty six hundred times as great as that of the earth so that if the outer surface were traversed by the same number of atoms as the inner their distribution would be thirty six hundred times rarer and they would in consequence cause a gravitation thirty six hundred times less this would be exactly that required by the theorems for this gravitating force would suffice to sustain at a distance sixty times as great a moving body whose absolute velocity was square root of sixty times less than that required by a body revolving at the surface of the earth five the parallelism of path which epicurus had introduced in the atomic theory of leucippus and democritus was not exact since had it been so these atoms all moving with equal velocity could never have come in collision but epicurus required that they should collide in order that he might explain the formation of compound bodies without assuming the intervention of a superior cause hence he supposed the paths of the atoms to be slightly inclined to each other and it is well known that the introduction of the correction subjected him to many pleasantries and objections from philosophers of other sects six if however epicurus had embraced the doctrine of the convergence of the atoms toward a centre undoubtedly his opponents would have attacked this hypothesis quite as vigorously the epicureans in replying would have been able to explain this convergence by returning to the system of leucippus and democritus as follows imagine the atoms to move fortuitously in every direction and let us trace the result in the case of a body near the earth all the atoms coming toward the body from the direction of the earth would be cut off by it while from all other directions the body would be subjected to uninterrupted bombardment consequently there would be a resultant motion of the earth that is in the line of diminished resistance and this resultant motion would be exactly the same as if the bombarding atoms all converged toward the earth's centre instead of moving fortuitously seven the epicureans would have even ceased with avidity upon this occasion to give an air of disorder to the primitive movements of the universe for these would accord the better with their system of the origin of things otherwise sufficiently absurd and impious that there was no appearance of parallelism perfect or imperfect whereas all tendency to parallelism would appear to be the result of some particular design and consequently to indicate the operation of some intelligent being eight i speak of disorder in connection with primitive movements only the resultant motion of bodies having inertia would be directed toward the centre of our globe with great exactness in consequence of the combination of a vast number of impulses in different directions 
for it is a well-known result of the doctrine of chances that minor irregularities when in great number mutually compensate each other exactly so that each several inequality becomes imperceptible in its effect upon the resultant nine still another consideration would have led the atomists to make this same modification of the direction of motion of the gravitational atoms all will agree with me that they were certain to have met with one or other of these two objections or to have themselves raised them as the earth revolves without cessation about the sun the hypothesis that all the atoms are directed toward the centre of the earth would have required that each new shower of atoms must seek it in a different direction from that followed by the shower next proceeding a condition not in accord with the predilection of the sect of the epicureans for the operation of chance nor with their antipathy for occult qualities ten in order to extricate themselves from this difficulty the atomists would necessarily have rejoined that there was no place in the heavens equal in dimension to the earth toward which there did not advance in a given time quite as many atoms as our planet encounters in the same portion of time and that these other atoms were in motion exactly like those encountered by the earth not that there was any particular relation between places and the streams setting toward them but since it was essentially a confused movement equal areas must naturally intercept one equally as much as another the paths of the atoms which blindly traverse space and in consequence they must be equally exposed to their visits eleven when once the epicureans were thus come to explain the matter so neatly the most thoughtful and curious among them would certainly have followed out the consequences which could be easily deduced from the hypothesis and they would necessarily have arrived at the following propositions one the atoms which pass to one side of any central body contribute nothing to the force of gravitation which it exercises toward other bodies for such atoms are exactly counterbalanced by direct antagonists gravitation would be due solely to those atoms which are fortuitously directed toward the central body as we have seen the resultant action of these atoms is everywhere directed toward the central body like the rays of light converging toward a focus when assembled by a convex lens or a concave mirror hence it is proper to apply to them what has been proven in paragraph four touching the terrestrial gravitation that is to say the gravitational effect is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of the attracted body from the central body two the gravitational atoms are directed not only toward the centres of the greater bodies but toward each of their particles as well since they move indiscriminately in all directions in space the atoms moreover act effectively in those directions in which their antagonists are intercepted that is to say in all directions in which there are particles of matter therefore they tend to move the heavy masses which they encounter not toward the heavenly bodies in gross but toward each of their particles in detail hence the gravitation of masses toward the centre of a celestial body is nothing but the resultant of an imperceptible movement of the masses toward all parts of the great body as from certain passages of cicero and plutarch it appears had been before supposed by some of the ancients consequently this gravitation would be proportional to the number of the particles that is to say to the mass of the central body now from these two propositions alone there might have been deduced synthetically the entire theory of universal gravitation without further mention of gravitational atoms twelve this is the place to insert a certain proposition which is commonly spoken of as if it were distinct from those which teach that gravitation is universal but which appears to me to be included in that expression i refer to that which affirms that gravitation is mutual or reciprocal or in other words that it is subject to the ancient law of mechanics which states that action and reaction are equal i say that this is the place to consider this proposition because it can equally well be proved either through the introduction of the agent of gravitation as i have done in preceding paragraphs or by considering gravitation abstractly as i shall do in those which follow this proposition therefore forms as it were a gradation between those which i have established by the first method and those which i shall establish by the second first method 
inasmuch as one body is pushed toward another by the atoms which the second body has deprived of direct antagonists while the latter body is pushed toward the former by these same antagonists the two bodies are necessarily pushed toward each other with equal force whatever be the inequality of their masses or the differences in their forms second method since each particle of one of the two bodies tends toward every particle of the other the first body is urged toward the second with a force proportional to the number of particles which the second contains or in other words with a force proportional to the mass of the second furthermore since the impetus or momentum of the first body is the summation of the impetus of its separate particles it is proportional to the total mass of the first body thus it follows that the impetus of the first body is proportional to the product of the masses of the two bodies by a similar train of reasoning the impetus of the second body is also proportional to this product therefore the usual bodies are urged together with equal forces thirteen i am now in a position to examine what other consequences the ancients would probably have drawn from the principle of a mutual gravitation directly proportional to the masses and varying inversely as a square of the distance for the sake of brevity the mechanical cause may be left out of consideration in the discussion as these philosophers would have foreseen many difficulties in rigorously testing every consequence to see if it coincided exactly with observation and would therefore have refrained from embarking upon so serious a task before perceiving that the deductions accorded in gross with the results of experience i presume they would not seriously have applied geometry and computation to this gravitation without having first determined by simple reasonings what approximately would be the effects flowing from it and seeing that these conjectures accorded roughly with the real constitution of the universe i believe i do no violence to probabilities in presuming that the ancient philosophers would have been acquainted with some such reasonings having fewer matters than we to distract their attention they were able to make very exact deductions in subjects requiring nothing but meditation with reference to the acquired knowledge which would be needed in such reasonings it will be recalled that the theory of conic sections had been discovered and cultivated before the birth of epicurus that archimedes had made great advance in the doctrine of centres of gravity and that the ancient geometers and especially the last named employed approximations with great ingenuity when they were unable to attain to rigorous precision fourteen encouraged by these first successes and animated by the grandeur of the enterprise it is highly improbable that these ardent and subtle geometers would have stopped here they would doubtless have invented for the purpose some means for passing from the ratio of sensible quantities to that of their imperceptible elements and conversely from elementary quantities to their summation at least for the simple case required when one wishes to avoid the numerical computation of the small anomalies of the movements of the celestial bodies certainly they had sufficient patience and sagacity to succeed in finding such a method since they had had enough of these qualities to discover and advance in considerable degree the admirable doctrine of incommensurables and of exhaustions although these were not ordinarily used except in the consideration of the five regular bodies and were specially derived it is said to examine certain very hazardous and even fantastic conjectures of the pythagoreans and platonists fifteen practically if one omits from the theory of central forces those curious propositions and generalizations which can only be regarded as its luxuries as well as the delicate evaluations which are required only for the perfecting of astronomical tables all the rest may be demonstrated sufficiently for the uses of the physicist by the aid of lemmas less exact and universal than those of the calculus this has indeed been pointed out in some degree by several geometers but it may be realized still further if the reader will undertake by the same or analogous means of simplification to attack other propositions than those already so treated but the probability that the ancients would have been able to accomplish such demonstrations is still less necessary to the plan which i have proposed to myself as stated at the beginning of this essay 
than the probability that they would have discovered the simple relations mentioned in the thirteenth paragraph consequently the reader may if he prefers ignore the last three paragraphs and give attention only to matters which i have expressly engaged to establish sixteen i declared that the laws of kepler were necessary consequences of the doctrine that gravitation results from the impulsion of atoms moving in every direction since kepler's laws follow directly from those of newton i ought however to show for the benefit of readers less versed in the matter where it may be found proved that the first mentioned laws are the natural consequences of the second first that the law of areas proportional to times is a necessary consequence of gravitation always directed toward a single point is demonstrated by elementary geometry in the first proposition of newton's principia second that the law of squares of periodic times proportional to the cubes of the distances for bodies appearing to describe circles must necessarily follow from a gravitation inversely proportional to the square of the distance constitutes the second part of the sixth corollary to proposition four of the same work and may be demonstrated by elementary methods also for regular polygons which represent more nearly than exact circles the orbits traversed by bodies diverted slightly from their path by intermittent collisions third that the ellipticity of an orbit is the necessary consequence of gravitation directed toward its focus and reciprocally proportional to the square of the distance is the converse of proposition eleven of the same book this proposition has been more simply demonstrated as a consequence of the fiftieth of book three of the conics of apollonius i may pause here since in maintaining that the laws of kepler are an easy consequence of the system of atoms i have not pretended that their application to complex cases readily follows from the slight knowledge of geometry possessed by the ancients nevertheless i may add fourth that the proposition eleven of the principia once attained it does not appear to me difficult to establish the fiftieth which extends our second consequences to ellipses that is to say which proves that in ellipses as well the squares of the periodic times about an attracting body placed in one of the foci are proportional to the cubes of the mean distances seventeen let us now see how the laws of galileo may be derived from the hypothesis of the impulsion of the atoms the blows of corpuscles moving with a velocity more rapid than light upon a body which has fallen three or four seconds would be sensibly of the same strength as the preceding blows had been upon the same body when it had only fallen one or two seconds hence the successive accelerations of the body in equal times must be sensibly equal and the velocity at any instant must be sensibly proportional to the time elapsed since the beginning of the fall from this it follows necessarily that the space is traversed since the beginning are sensibly proportional to the squares of the total times and will be sensibly proportional to the successive odd numbers eighteen these synthetic demonstrations of laws of falling bodies by the introduction of mechanism whose existence is only surmised may perhaps be less philosophical than analytic demonstrations which are based entirely upon observed phenomena still it must be recalled that in cases where direct observation has been difficult and inexact error has frequently attended deductions of this latter kind at all events the former kind of demonstration is much more philosophical than a gratuitous hypothesis which is nevertheless the means of invention employed by galileo and its results are quite as well established as are the laws of galileo since they are proved by exactly the same means that is by the sensible accord of their consequences with the phenomena nothing else than this is claimed by galileo himself and his principal successors nineteen but the atomists would have encountered one very serious objection to which they were necessarily exposed in common with all physicists who undertake an explanation of gravitation for by having thickness a roof receives not a whit more of hail or a shield of arrows whereas remaining otherwise unchanged the weight of all bodies is augmented in direct proportion of their thickness conversely when one removes a heavy body from a shop 
or dwelling or reduces it to sheets exposed without protection to material influences the rain for example it receives more than when protected or concentrated so as to present a small surface but it has never been found by merchants and artisans who are continually in the habit of weighing that bodies appear heavier in open air than when under cover and gold beaters have never perceived that the weight of the metal augments in proportion to the increase of its surface in a word if the collision of atoms is the cause of heaviness the weight of bodies ought to be proportional to their surface or rather to their horizontal projection how then does it happen that the weight is proportional to the mass do the gravitational atoms then act across the thickest and most compact envelopes of all substances as fully as through the air and does not the very sensible weight which they impart to these envelopes demonstrate the contrary that is that all substances arrest the passage of a great number of corpuscles twenty to this the epicureans would have been forced to respond that the atoms doubtless traverse very freely all heavy bodies as freely for example as light passes through diamond and magnetic matter through gold though one of these bodies is the hardest and the other the heaviest of all known bodies which shows that they are less porous than most substances thus the number of atoms which are intercepted by the first layers of a heavy body would be absolutely insensible relatively to the number of those which pass through the last layers nevertheless the relatively small number intercepted would produce a sensible action upon the body since they have in virtue of an immense velocity the force of impact which they would lack by reason of their small mass twenty one a second difficulty which would have embarrassed the more scrupulous atomists is that the mutual collision of the atoms would retard their motions repeatedly and diminish consequently the gravitational action any such effect nevertheless has hitherto been imperceptible now it would be useless to offer in explanation that the sum of the motions would remain the same since this is only true when the word sum is used in the sense of geometers who comprehend by it the difference of contraries such a definition is readily seen to offer no assistance to the atomist in the case of equality of contrary movements for the algebraic sum of the motions of the atoms is zero before as after the collision but before the collision they were capable of effects of which they are incapable afterwards twenty two it is apparent that such mutual encounters would be the more rare the smaller the atoms were supposed to be compared with the intervals between them these intervals cannot however be assumed very great since gravitation manifests no sensible interruption even in places and times the most adjacent so that the only conceivable recourse to render the encounter of the gravitational atoms sufficiently rare is to suppose them extremely small happily this device is completely sufficient conceive two balls whose centre strays given courses in different planes in order that they may never meet it suffices to diminish the sum of their semi-diameters till it becomes less than the least distance between their paths but since with diminishing size the atoms would be less efficient to produce gravitation the intensity of which is fixed by phenomena it is necessary to see if their effectiveness may be maintained by some other properties i see no recourse of this nature except in the increase of individual density or of velocity these two recourses appear very natural and are at the same time the more satisfactory because they were very probably in accord with the spirit of the atomists of whom i speak and would probably have sufficed to close the mouths of their adversaries twenty three third difficulty each celestial body perpetually finds atoms in its path which it necessarily displaces in passing onward this cannot occur without the atoms communicating to the body a part of their motion and in consequence causing its retardation exclusive of all other elements except the mass displaced this retardation is proportional to the density of the medium made up of these atoms and their interstices now the gravitation of the body exclusive of all other elements than these atomic mass is proportional to this same mean density how then can it be that the retardation is imperceptible 
while the gravitation is so sensible the objection is rendered the more forcible when we consider that the retardation of a revolving body is brought about by all the atoms which it meets in its orbit while its gravitation is produced only by those which at any one position in its orbit are directed toward the central body twenty four reply other things being equal the force of gravitation being produced by the single stream of atoms deprived of antagonists is proportional to the square of the velocity of the atoms by a proposition demonstrated generally while the retardation above spoken of being caused by the stream opposing the planet in its motion is proportional to the product of this velocity of the atoms by that of the revolving body as we shall prove directly consequently things being equal the gravitation is to the retardation as the velocity of the atoms is to that of the revolving body now it is not hard to believe that the velocity of the atoms is greater than that of the revolving body and indeed all that we have heretofore said would lead to the presumption that it is incomparably greater hence the system of thin sown atoms moving in every direction agrees very well with a condition of gravitation incomparably greater than the retardation and it agrees still despite the consideration which fortifies the difficulty which we are considering since the velocity has always been assigned to the atoms greater than would have been necessarily to obviate this latter difficulty alone remark i have said that the retardation of a great body caused by the opposing stream of atoms moving much more rapidly than the body itself would be proportional to the product of the velocity of the atoms by that of the great body i shall first demonstrate this proposition with respect to the couple of opposed streams parallel to the direction of the great body and in so doing i shall have proved it for the case of opposing streams oblique to this direction since their motions may be decomposed in two directions the one parallel and the other perpendicular to the direction of the body of which the first is nearly always much greater than the motion of the body and of which the second produces no effect demonstration the total retardation of the body is the excess of the simple retardation it experiences from the stream which it encounters over the simple acceleration which it experiences on the part of the stream which pursues it now these simple factors are proportional to the squares of velocities which are respectively the sum and difference of the absolute velocity of the atoms and the absolute velocity of the body consequently the resultant retardation is proportional to the excess of the square of the sum over the square of the difference which by the eighth proposition of the second book of the elements of euclid is four times the product of the absolute velocities in question twenty five to the three difficulties above mentioned may be reduced all those which are plausible since there can be no other changes in the motions of a heavy body or in the motions of the gravitational fluid or in their constitution except those which proceed from some opposition or interposition either on the part of the particles of the heavy body which hinder the atoms composing the fluid from reaching their destination or from particles of the fluid itself the one opposing the other or finally from the effect of the latter on the path of the heavy body the solutions of all these difficulties depend either on the permeability of the heavy body or the subtlety and rapidity of the gravitational atoms properties to none of which we are obliged to assign two opposing limits this last expression signifies that while several considerations may unite to augment the intensity of such or such property yet no consideration requires a diminution in the intensity of the same property and that reciprocally no considerations tend to limit the diminutiveness of properties of which certain other considerations limit more and more the magnitude there are no conditions which give opposing indications and which therefore obstruct the choice of remedies this assertion would be tedious to establish but very few readers will contest its correctness twenty six while we speak of alterations and remedies it is for me to conform to the irregularities of our ordinary progress in research truth never permits us to discover her at first seeking with all her following train of verities but we proceed gradually in discovery by tedious gropings and corrections 
to this procedure a writer ought also in some measure to conform in the exposition of truths which he has finally discovered when the greatness or smallness of the objects discussed transcends that of the majority of those objects with which we are familiar and when he believes that his reader will not at first be disposed to countenance suppositions so excessive but only in a measure as he shall have shown him their necessity for the reader will have had no perspective to apply to this immensity or that diminutiveness if it has been assumed at the start in sufficient measure to satisfy all phenomena the author might with equal justice assume at the start a magnitude or diminutiveness sufficient for the purpose since in explaining the phenomena the physicist takes the place so far as he may of the creator a being who having determined precisely in advance all the consequences of the different intensities which might be given to such or such properties has chosen in each case that intensity most proper to attain the desired result and has precisely determined the consequences without any preliminary trial twenty seven all other conceivable objections are founded on certain regularities or irregularities of detail which have not been minutely set forth but gratuitously assumed and which in consequence ought not seriously to be taken into account or in the second place such objections may be founded on the tenets of some metaphysical sect before responding to such objections i pray these metaphysicists to first agree among themselves or finally they address themselves to the imagination rather than to the understanding thus some may be shocked at what in this system is extreme strange or extraordinary as if it was after our gross and limited measures that the subtlety and grandeur of nature must be evaluated as if a confused repugnance sufficed to condemn a theory which depends neither on taste nor sentiment or as if one ought to follow so vilely the beaten track even in researches where no success has ever come to those who have followed it twenty eight if one is satisfied with the exact agreement of this system with physical astronomy and with terrestrial phenomena he ought not to distrust it as if this apparent conformity were the effect of the artfulness with which i have adjusted matters or as if other systems also might be rectified so as to agree throughout with the phenomena should a hand more skilful take the same pains to accommodate them to each other i have not added to the atoms sung by lucretius any feature directed solely toward the explanation of the great laws discovered by the moderns but on the contrary i have merely divested the motion of these atoms of an arbitrary feature the nearly perfect parallelism by which epicurus had disfigured the unrestricted motion assumed by democritus that was a motion so simple that it would appear as if its inventor had proposed it with no other end but the most absolute simplicity unconcerned that it might in no way explain real phenomena but rather perhaps contradict them so that it is impossible that any system can equal this in simplicity i would even have had no need to advise myself of this correction in reading the poem of lucretius if i had been instructed beforehand in the system of lucippus and democritus as i was long after this reading finally the explanations which i have offered ought not to be regarded as in any respect modifications of this system of atoms for it would be impossible not to follow upon these explanations in seeking to follow out the necessary consequences of this system twenty nine i did not take undue credit to myself when as a child i rectified the system taught by lucretius and drew from it immediately its most important consequences for this was extremely easy or rather entirely natural besides i knew but little more the value and solidity of my little views than the child ordinarily knows the wit or sense which we find in its repartees and sallies indeed the extremely simple idea of trying to explain the principal natural phenomena by the aid of a subtle fluid vigorously agitated in every direction has come to many writers who have before presented it in a vague and ill-assured fashion not to mention that there has been without doubt a still greater number who have not even deigned to communicate at all i am well convinced that since the law governing the intensity of universal gravitation is similar to that for light 
the thought will have occurred to many physicists that an ethereal substance moving in rectilinear paths may be the cause of gravitation and that they may have applied to it whatever of skill in the mathematics they have possessed thirty but we may say how is it that none of these physicists have pushed these consequences to their conclusion and communicated their research doubtless because the most of them having no clear view of this chaos of which the first glance is i admit frightful they have not known how to disentangle it and subject it to their calculations or not having firmly grasped the principles of the theory they have allowed themselves to be seduced by specious sophisms by which men have pretended to refute in advance all imaginable explanations of gravitation or they will have had the foible of bowing to the authority of great names when it is alleged whether justly or falsely that they have pronounced upon the possibility of this or upon the uselessness of that branch of knowledge or they have lacked sufficient love of truth or courage of their convictions to abandon easy pleasures and exterior advantages in order to devote themselves simply to researches at a time difficult and little welcome or finally they have failed to become impressed with the strength and fecundity of this beautiful system so distinctly as to lead them in their enthusiasm to sacrifice to it their other views and projects appendix constitutions which i assign to heavy bodies and to the gravitational fluid followed by a mathematical conception and some remarks to fix the ideas of geometers who desire to follow out for themselves the consequences of this mechanism and who may desire first to know precisely what are the hypotheses from which i claim all the phenomena to follow necessarily constitution of heavy bodies first their indivisible particles or cages for example hollow cubes or octohedra they are in other words skeletons of solids of which there is nothing material except the edges second the diameters of the bars of these cages even if supposed increased by the diameters of the gravitational corpuscles as they must be in order to conveniently evaluate the portion of the atoms intercepted are so small relative to the distances between the parallel bars of the same cage that all the particles included in the terrestrial globe intercept not the ten thousandth part of the corpuscles which present themselves to traverse it third these diameters are all equal or if they are unequal their inequalities sensibly compensate each other if for instance in the smallest portion of matter separately ponderable which it has been stated may weigh one thirty-second part of a grain the mean diameter of the bars of the one portion does not differ a tenth part from the mean diameter of the bars of the other then it would follow that in the greatest ponderable masses the mean diameters do not differ by a ten thousandth part for every such great ponderable mass is composed of so large a number of indivisible particles that simple chance suffices to almost perfectly effect a compensation of diameters constitution of gravitational corpuscles first conformably to the second of the preceding suppositions the diameter of the gravitational corpuscle added even to that of the bars of the indivisible particles is so small relatively to the mutual distance of the parallel bars of a single cage that the weight of celestial bodies does not sensibly vary from the ratio between their masses second the gravitational corpuscles are isolated so that their progressive movements are necessarily rectilinear third they are so thinly scattered that is to say their diameters are so small relative to their mutual mean distance that there are no more than a few hundreds which encounter one another in the course of a thousand years hence the uniformity of their movements is never sensibly disturbed four they move in several thousand of thousands of different directions even counting as one all those which are parallel to the same line the distribution of these directions may be conceived as follows first imagine all the points conceived to lie in different directions strewn upon a sphere as uniformly as is possible and consequently separated from one another by less than a second of arc then imagine a corpuscular path radiating from each of these points fifth parallel to each of these directions there moves a stream of torrent of corpuscles now 
In order to give it no more than the necessary size, the transverse section of this current has the same contour as the orthogonal projection of the visible universe upon the plane of this section. Sixth, the different parts of a single current are sensibly of equal density, either where contemporary portions of sensible magnitude or successive portions occupying sensible times in traversing a given surface are compared. The densities of different currents are also equal. Seventh, the mean velocity determined in the same manner as the mean density is also sensibly constant. Eighth, this velocity is several thousand times as great relative to the velocities of the planets as is the gravitation of the planets toward the sun relative to the greatest resistances which secular observations permit us to suppose their experience for example several hundred times greater relative to the velocity of the earth than the gravitation of the earth toward the sun multiplied by the number of times the firmament would contain the disk of the sun is greater than the greatest resistance which the secular differences in the length of the year permit us to suppose the earth experiences from celestial matter concept which facilitates the application of mathematics to determine the mutual influence of the heavy bodies and the corpuscles first decompose all heavy bodies into equal masses so small as to allow them to be treated without sensible error as attractive particles are treated in those theories of gravitation in which no hypothesis is made as to its cause in such a small mass the effects of unequal distance and position of its particles relative to those of the mass which is conceived to attract it and to be attracted by it may be neglected such masses will have a diameter no more than one one hundred thousandth as great as the mutual distance of the two masses under examination thus the apparent semi-diameter of one as viewed from the other does not exceed one second second for the surfaces of this mass accessible but impermeable to the gravitational fluid substitute a single spherical surface equal to their sum third decompose these first surfaces into facets sufficiently small to be treated as planes without sensible error fourth transport all these facets to the spherical surface above mentioned each one of the facets should in this transformation occupy that point of the spherical surface at which the tangent plane is parallel to the original position of the facet remarks first it is not necessary to be very expert to deduce upon these suppositions all the laws of gravitation both terrestrial and universal and consequently those of kepler and some others with as much of precision and more as the phenomena themselves furnish for these laws are the inevitable consequences of the constitutions i have supposed second although i here present these constitutions crudely and without proof as if they were gratuitous hypotheses and adventurous fictions the fair-minded reader will perfectly comprehend that i have at hand some presumptions at least in their favour independent of the perfect accord with all the phenomena but which i withhold as too extended for development in this place these suppositions may then be regarded as theorems published without demonstration third their number is likely to inspire some opposition at first glance but the attentive mind will not fail to see that they are but details into which i have wished to enter because of the novelty of this doctrine and that they will be readily understood when it shall have become sufficiently well known that its students may attend under favourable circumstances to the details if the authors who have written upon hydrodynamics aeronautics or optics have had readers who doubted the existence of water air and light and who consequently indulged no tacit supposition upon equalities or compensations of which no express mention was made they too would be obliged to add a great number of explanations to their definitions which instructed or indulgent readers might well dispense with we do not accept of hints and sano sensu except for propositions which are familiar and in whose favour there is a predisposition end of the newtonian lucretius by Monsieur Lesage. On Gravitation and Relativity by Ralph Allen Sampson.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in November 2017. On Gravitation and Relativity Being the Halley Lecture Delivered on June 12, 1920 by Ralph Allen Sampson, Doctor of Science, Fellow of the Royal Society, Astronomer Royal for Scotland. The idea of gravity presented little difficulty to the ancients. Each existence was ruled by its peculiar law. Even lifeless things were animated by a power, whether it originated within them or without them, which impelled them to seek the centre of the world. Thought appeared here to run in an easy familiar groove, but the theory of a moving earth upset it. For why did things seek to reach its centre if the earth was not the centre of the world, but merely a minor satellite of the sun? The difficulty called for a new revolution of ideas, it echoed afresh Copernicus's quotation, Prove himur portu, terraque urbesque recedunt. We are swept from our anchorage indeed, the lands we knew, the cities we dwelt in, fade into mist. Metaphysical juggling with physical matters was at that time a staple of the universities, and Galileo was a master juggler. He gives its proper prominence to the feature I refer to in his Dialogues on the systems of Ptolemy and Copernicus. He uses all his art to expose the illusions and the tricks current among rival professors of his craft. We see the doomed theory as a tottering, impossible, ridiculous edifice. To the seed spread by this book, fostered by the immense notoriety of its author's prosecution, one is perhaps not wrong in tracing the growth, essentially British as it is, of the study of the positive in natural science. Oxford took an active part in it. The characteristic motto of the Royal Society well expresses it, Nullius in verba, which I translate Wrangler's vaunt. It was made good in their early proceedings, where the hoary, accumulated traditions and travellers' tales of past centuries were put to experimental proof and swept away. We know that Newton as a student eagerly read these proceedings. There can hardly be a doubt that he read as eagerly Galileo's dialogues, then widely current in many editions, and in Salisbury's classical translation. No need for an apple to fall upon his head to set his thoughts in motion if he found the following. Salviatus I say that that which maketh the earth to move is a virtue, like to that by which Mars and Jupiter I moved, and wherewith he believes that the starry sphere itself also does move. And if he will but assure me who is the mover of one of these movables, I will undertake to be able to tell him who maketh the earth to move. Nay, more, I will undertake to do the same if he can but tell me who moveth the parts of the earth downwards. Simplicius, the cause of this is most manifest, and every one knows that it is gravity. Salviatus, you are out, Simplicius. You should say that every one knows that it is called gravity, but I do not question you about the name, but the essence of the thing, of which essence you know not a little more than you know the essence of the mover of the stars in gyration, unless it be the name that hath been put to this and made familiar and domestical by the many experiences which we see thereof every hour in the day, but not as if we really understand any more what principle or virtue that is which moveth a stone downwards, than we know who moveth it upwards when it is separated from the progiciant, or who moveth the moon round, except, as I have said, only the name which more particularly and properly we have assigned to the motion of descent, namely, gravity. Once more a period of change and inquiry has come, and we are told that the lands and cities that Copernicus and Newton have led us to are not permanent dwelling places. Once more are we bidden to cast loose from our anchorage in space, 
and adventure on an uncharted ocean to discover new and strange continents once more we must endeavour to restate the metaphysical postulates of argument as newton so profoundly and adequately stated his own and once more astronomy is the arbiter and guide newton always professed a distaste for speculation as ending in idle wrangling and within the covers of the principia he eschewed it altogether yet his speculations upon subjects which to us are also still matters of speculation are among his most interesting legacies there is one of these in a letter to robert boyle sketching the cause of gravitation as he pictured it to himself which i could make the support for the few uncompleted remarks i am going to offer remarks which claim no merit beyond that of presenting difficulties where i see them newton conceived gravitation to be due to pressure by the ether his ether was atomic and in a normal state exerted pressure upon matter somewhat after the manner of gas pressure but working not as we now conceive gas pressure to work by impacts of its moving molecules but by some form of elastic resilience at rest these ether atoms penetrate the pores of matter and as they approach any material condensation they become rarer in distribution and their resilience is less thus any two bodies find themselves under pressure upon all sides but always less on the sides they present to one another they are therefore impelled towards one another and this is the phenomenon of gravitation newton did not assign any law to the rarefication of the ether which occurs in the neighbourhood of matter but this is easily supplied if we suppose mass in matter is merely representative of the numerical collection of equal ultimate particles and if for each particle the reduction of pressure induced in the surrounding ether is inversely proportional to the distance from that particle that is to say if p is constant minus m divided by r then newton's conception of an ether pressure is in every respect identical with his law of gravitation let us then conceive of atoms of matter as singularities movable in the ether and wherever they go relaxing its spring or potential energy in their own neighbourhood let us employ this conception in a few rough illustrations in order to mark the character of the phenomena that fall to be explained and the number of indispensable elements that must be introduced for the purpose let us economize by treating of space of two dimensions we then have a third dimension at disposal which may be used to indicate relative potential energies measuring the essential tendencies that bodies have to move to other positions for let it be admitted as it has been proved by many an ancient paradox that events conceived in terms of space alone leave motion incomprehensible motion is an independent essential element in phenomena nature's garment that we know her by is a moving living thing der gottheit lebendiges kleid motion or the tendency to motion or any other manifestation of the time element is the weft of this garment and space is its warp the fabric does not exist if one of them is absent imagine then the ether as an elastic skin stretched let us say on the surface of a sheet of water the depth of the water below it serving as an index of potential energy an atom of matter which is characterized by the property of relaxing the potential energy in the surrounding ether would figure in this model as a heavy particle resting on the skin and producing a small pocket or depression in the water surface if we have two material bodies the ether pockets associated with each would superpose their depressions with the result that the bodies would tend to move towards one another each tends to fall into the pit made by the other this is gravitation if they possessed any relative motion transverse to the line between them they would circulate round one another 
it is an easy matter to write down the equations of motion of a single minute particle on the surface of such an ether pocket they differ from the familiar forms for a plane orbit in introducing what may be considered as a double measure of distance namely distance from the axis of the pocket and distance measured along its curved surface in consequence of this feature if the grading of the potential energy in the pocket is adjusted so as to give say a law of attraction according to the inverse square for motion in a direct line towards the center when there is transverse motion a closed orbit will not be described the pure law of inverse square is the only law we need consider valid for all distances that will keep the apse fixed change it in any small respect and the apse will move this is the phenomenon known as the progression of the apse now take another feature the transmission of light this must be imagined as a wave transmitted in and by the ether skin the velocity which will be greater or less according as the local resilience in the ether is greater or less will always be less when the wave passes the relaxed region that is near matter in consequence of this the wave front will wheel round matter that it passes like a file of soldiers turning a corner those near the pivot moving slower this is the gravitational deflection of light we are not yet done with our model the use of ether pockets and a three-dimensional space figure to explain gravitation in a two-dimensional space might be described as explaining it in terms of a curvature of space the double measure of distance referred to above throws light upon this description it is nothing but a form of words no curvature of the two-dimensional ether field can be ascertained unless we retain a flat two-dimensional space field to compare it with the double measure of distance must be retained but it may all be on the flat the one measure being a geometrical measure independent in scale of the place where it is applied and the other based say upon counting the ether atoms or some other suitable mechanical feature around the particle these being differently spaced as we receive from its neighborhood an experiment on these lines is easy to perform with balls of paraffin wax floating in water and supported by the surface film that they try to drag down with them the pits that they form in the water will seek one another out over considerable distances the theory of the phenomenon in this actual case would of course require a slightly different wording but merely to the extent of referring to the potential energy of the film as well as that of the pit in the water needless to say i do not bring this experiment before you as something new i bring it as something old I bring it too as illustrating the amount of tautology which is present in almost all we can say in explanation of gravitation an explanation is the exchange of two statements for one to exchange one statement for another is no explanation it may be considered a simpler view to accept an energy relation between n separate bodies and one universal medium than to regard the more numerous separate relations between these bodies without such a medium but there is no more in it than that the ultimate acceptance of the possession by each body of some virtue however described which induces other bodies to move towards it is present here and it is none the less present in any other theory that has been offered it would be idle to cross-examine our rough hypotheses and ask if they can supply results metrically correct if they did it would be no confirmation of them needless to say they are not in the least intended to compete with the theory in which einstein has put all he has to say without redundancy defect or effort into one consummate formula their poverty and clumsiness their age and obviousness are intended to show how much of the intelligible outcome may be found in the crudest theory we can enunciate that attributes gravitation to the medium 
there never was a bolder theory than that with which einstein met the difficulty left by michelson and morley if it were not for his adventures raids or conquests in the territories of space and time the subject would hardly have been heard of in the greater world as it is because of its boldness its range its brilliance and resounding successes all who are interested in ideas must endeavor to grasp its position it is algebra that is the key the force as well as the beauty of algebra comes from its symmetry by its aid the magician with his wand can order hosts as easily as if they were units small blame then to mathematicians who have a passion to symmetricalize their data but they do it at their own risk the portrait of nature that they supply only interests the investigator of nature in so far as he can recognize the lineaments the mathematician's word is not enough when he bids us to merge time and space into one medium to bend our minds until we can conceive a curvature in them both and to picture each as a complex quantity possessing imaginary as well as real parts the plan must be examined on its merits for we know that he has adopted it merely for its convenience it is already a great demand to admit positive and negative in time and so to obliterate in principle the distinction between past and future it is parallel to the old-fashioned convention of electrostatics now known to be so misleading which regarded positive and negative in electricity as a mere mathematical antithesis the prominence of such instances as the swing of a pendulum where the reversibility is pretty nearly perfect is purely due to selection are we to admit the possibility as lord kelvin put it that a man could live backwards and become again unborn for all that nature bears upon her face phenomena may only allow of being linked in chains of causation one way around we should of course make next to no progress if we insisted on taking no step until we were ready to prove it was right when newton affirmed the law of gravitation verified as between sun and planets for every particular atom of matter it must be admitted his grounds for doing so were far from demonstrative he said it was rendered general by induction he was carried forward by an instinct for mathematical symmetry in the same way it must be admitted that einstein has speculated as genius only is justified in doing and only genius by success thus take first what may be described as the motive power in his mathematical machinery the principle of equivalence which allows him to search his field with the processes and results of the theory of invariance if it be surmised that the difficulty we are examining has its source in confused communication of elementary notions and measures of space and time as between a and b we may well suppose that it would disappear if we could assign the equation or substitution that expresses a's estimates in terms of b's but may we then affirm that for a fundamental fact of nature like gravitation only that part and version of our expression is real which survives in invariant form a general algebraic substitution that substitution moreover embracing time and space undistinguished in the same category the mathematician will take that course without fear for he knows that his tall ship can ride the deep seas he knows he will wreck her at once if he follows the variety of nature's coastline he is safe when he is out of his depth but who will be inclined to follow him nature does not possess the generality of an algebra on the contrary all its manifestations are extraordinarily special that is their peculiar charm birds insects animals the rocks the trees appear to be mere fragments and accidents compared to the variety that might have been and if the particles of which they are composed approach closer to elementary uniformity and the notions of space and time which lie behind them are more uniform again 
still one remains at a loss to conceive any region that may correspond to the imaginary field of the algebraist nonsense of the purest water can be derived from treating space and time on a united footing we know how to rotate a body about a point or an axis in four dimensions we must learn to rotate it about a face the mind does not respond to the suggestion no matter let us suppose it done we turn a cube over and it becomes a square multiplied into a period of time if that appears obscure you can illuminate it by recalling that the period of time belongs to an inhabitant of mars a quart consumed today may perhaps be proved congruent to a pint consumed tomorrow the turtles academy in looking-glass land is the place where these propositions belong it is a thousand pities that lewis carroll did not live to exploit their possibilities but this is not the only paradox which einstein's theory carries and be it not forgotten carries to success the foregoing relates to its process its physical basis is the deduction or generalization or speculation from the michelson morley experiment that each separate observer possesses his own peculiar notions and standards of space and time which are incapable of telling him whether he is himself in motion and which are not communicable to another so as to permit adjustment except indeed as so far as the velocity of light appears to each under all circumstances the same to have made out of this material a theory which is certainly coherent and will stand examination is to say the least an astonishing mathematical feat it would seem one would say to float in the void like a meteor in space it is true that it too may be forced into ludicrous antinomies with which some of its disciples possibly unused to metaphysics and suddenly speaking with tongues have perhaps more surprised than edified their hearers but the theory is possible though it is difficult and in some cases its steps have been actually performed and as we all know it has been shown to contain not merely descriptively but exactly and metrically the rate of progression of the perihelion of mercury and the gravitational deflection of light now can we gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles that is the question or rather the question is is this particular fruit a fig or is it an apple of sodom before expressing an opinion i would ask you to regard from a different standpoint the question of determining absolute position and that of communication between observers to say that two observers a and b separated from one another can have no common verifiable standard of time is to contemplate a very special set of circumstances it is indeed true if they are receding from one another in a straight line for their comparisons are complicated by the time of transmission of the signals and cannot be cleared from it unless the circumstances can be repeated with some variation but this case is merely a mathematician's abstraction he has moreover abstracted from it everything that makes it an actual case our knowledge of nature is not reached by clean-cut steps of ratiocination lest of all our primary perceptions only by continual repetition are permanent ideas detached at last and imperfectly from an intricate unremembered background of the mind we should know nothing at all about such circumstances there is no knowledge without repetition or without memory or the time element in some form no repetition is possible when two bodies are simply moving apart now we are supplied with many natural measures of time and many of these are capable of common use we have the pulses of our body which we can use as indeed galileo used them when he timed the swing for different arts of the chandelier in pisa cathedral some people have the gift of absolute pitch in music which is a time measure and which they constantly employ in harmony with others 
one even might add temperature the constant temperature of the body which physicists recognize as a velocity datum but the commonest of all is the rotation of the earth subdivided by the beats of a pendulum consider then the bearing of a rotating system or of any repeating system on the question of absolute or at least consistent determinations of time and space in a matter like this where the metaphysical basis of theory is in dispute decidedly we should begin with experiment there are two experiments simple old classical familiar which should be kept constantly in mind the first is newton's experiment of the rotating bucket to demonstrate that absolute rotation can be perceived though relative rotation may be insensible quite contrary to what might be guessed from the analogy of linear motion he tells us he performed it repeatedly evidently he attached considerable importance to it fill the bucket with water set it in rotation and allow it to communicate its motion to its contents at first the water appears undisturbed relative to the bucket though there is actually relative rotation later when bucket and water move together and there is no relative rotation the absolute rotation of the water may be perceived by the water hollowing in the centre and creeping up the sides of the bucket the second is foucault's pendulum if the earth were completely covered with cloud and neither sun nor stars were ever visible its axis of rotation and its rate of rotation relative it would seem to an absolutely external universe could be correctly determined within the limits of the experiment by swinging a freely suspended pendulum no conceivable gloss can deprive these experiments of their plain significance and it is this the data of nature which are within our reach are such as regards the motional element that we can perceive the axis and the rate of a rotating body with regard to fields that may be otherwise entirely outside of our ken this is a piece of knowledge at least as striking as any of the negations of relativity admitting it and who is there that questions it we may be permitted to proceed with the argument more succinctly with a construction that is indeed imaginary but is so simple that i doubt if the most thoroughgoing relativist will question what would be its outcome imagine two concentric spheres of radii virtually equal a is an observer on the outer surface of the inner sphere and b is an observer on the inner surface of the outer sphere the surfaces of the spheres that are presented to one another are featureless and perfectly reflecting let b in the first instance be diametrically opposite to a and let a send out a light signal the waves will be reflected at the outer sphere and i say will converge together at the same phase on b they will then diverge again and will converge a second time on the point from which they were emitted again together and in the same phase but if the inner sphere is in rotation and a has moved from a zero to a one in the interval it is evident unless this result can be denied that the observer a can identify the point absolute with respect to the medium transmitting the signal waves which he occupied at a specific earlier moment there is nothing in this of a surprising character or inconsistent with other experiences of rotation but it is much at variance with the implications of relativity let me then add two further points the first relates to the doctrine of the essential relativity of time both as to its zero and as to its scale the scale is much the more interesting and important point in order to secure the adopted canon of relativity that two observers a and b shall always attribute the same value of the velocity of light even when one of them is himself moving through the ether with that velocity the intrinsic scale of time measurement is itself made dependent on the motion this is the subtlest and boldest of all einstein's ideas 
a curious result follows a and b both measure the time interval between two events and report to one another a considers b's scale of measure is too small and b considers a's scale is too small evidently we must be prepared for paradoxes the nearest analogy we can find is in geometrical perspective a and b are separated by a few yards and each holds out in front of him a yard measure perspectively b's measure appears to a smaller than his own and a's appears to b smaller than his own the solution is not remote they have not used satisfactory means of communication by stepping up to one another and superposing the scales this individual geometry of the solipsist in which each has been indulging may be exchanged for one common to both with a great enlightenment of view besides when they reflect how the converging representation summed up to the tiny surface of the retina has hitherto represented for each differently the infinite expanse of external space with its three dimensions now let our two observers be a at greenwich and b on the moon a observes the transit of b and b observes a on the terrestrial meridian bisecting the earth's disk if there is such a thing as a geometrical event these are simultaneous each observer would time the occurrence not right but a little late by the same amount by taking this observation repeatedly each would have the same time interval a mean lunar day for common use it is only if they confined themselves to signals which did not admit of the repetition that eliminates irrelevant admixtures that they would suffer under a relativity in their time measures that is the first point i would make the second is a question how can our experience from rotation so falsify the notions of relativity derived from translation in the example of the pair of spheres it is plain that there is a proportion of arbitrary construction there is no need to consider the motion of the inner sphere either as uniform or as taking place about a fixed axis let a zero a one a two a three be any four points on the path of a describe a sphere through them and complete the construction as before but make these the points occupied by a as successive returns of the signal after girdling the globe in this way any absolute path of a can be traced in space step by step except in the case where any three of the four points lie in a straight line that is to say except for linear motion for linear motion then the construction is impossible the repetitions upon which we are dependent do not take place for linear motion then it is reasonable to expect that the degree of determinateness should be less and that we should be unable to eliminate from our conclusions certain irrelevant features if such a feature is unexpected it may declare itself in the form of a paradox such cases are well known in mathematics where the determinateness of a solution breaks down owing to some relation among the data they are known by the name of porisms euclid studied them einstein's theory of relativity expresses the conclusions that follows from supposing that linear motion is our only standard it is a porism the most gigantic porism the world has ever seen or is likely to see porisms have probably rightly been regarded as the severest test of a mathematician's power and dexterity but they lose some of the interest attached to solutions which are at the same time complete and indeterminate if we are able to make a supplementary statement which causes their indeterminateness to disappear it must not be supposed that in confronting the new theory with the facts of rotation we are putting an unfair strain upon it true it is derived from considerations of linear motion alone 
but the immense interest of relativity is that it disturbs the very basis of knowledge and asserts that we can know nothing of position in space and time nor of space and time themselves except as merged into one medium it might not be difficult to admit that there are regions of knowledge to which those statements apply as in fact various familiar formulae of dynamics have been deduced from einstein's equation but it is as nearly obvious as anything can be that rotation is a phenomenon that does not possess this featureless symmetry rotation proves the existence of a domain in which the law of relativity does not run now periodic motions of all kinds vibrations oscillations waves the rotation of the earth the celestial motions are the best known of all motional phenomena for the reason that they offer themselves for repeated examination and permit the removal of irrelevant features we cannot leave them out if we would however coherent the theory of relativity may be in the regions which it claims as its own it is intolerable to make everything subject to it rather i submit that its two great postulates must be taken as defining and limiting the region of its validity and further that the expanse of this region must be found by trial and is certainly not co-extensive with the whole but take care lest we say too much if the theory of relativity is a gratuitous mathematical feat what becomes of the formidable michelson morley experiment which it undoubtedly explained what is the meaning of einstein's two brilliant successes in astronomy once the ship is afloat what does it matter how it was launched or to go back to the figure with which we started if we conclude that we need not one and all embark upon the ship and leave the cities and the lands we dwell in shall we not still find that ship very useful for plying to and fro we may not be forced to abandon our notions of space and time such as they are and adopt others which be it confessed are at present far from clear but we still have those obstinate physical facts to explain and can we explain them any better i will put you a conundrum if a theory explains a fact what is the position of the theory it would be a simple mind that concluded that the theory was true if the theory is incomplete in premises or definition almost no binding conclusion can be drawn except by accumulation of cases and this is the position in regard to the vast mass of our knowledge of nature a theory such as that of evolution commands for a period universal assent but later its unexplored contingencies seem more and more unmanageable and after the better part of a century of study it is found that though the theory is held more firmly than ever in some form its actual process remains in darkness but the position is somewhat different with an exact theory such as einstein's relativity relativity is not a complete theory but it is an exact one i have not myself succeeded in forming from it any idea of the nature of light there seems no room in it for wave features or interference or polarization it has less the character of a physical optics than of a geometrical optics but if it is an outline merely it is a firm outline and its contingencies are presented all at once apply such a theory in explanation of a fact and we can draw a definite conclusion namely that the fact does not as a necessity imply any more comprehensive postulates than the theory presents when the fact is a very general one such as gravitation and the postulates are no more than an attenuated medium in which einstein has succeeded in floating his theory this conclusion is more weighty than might be expected i began by showing how the descriptive facts of gravitation might be inferred from a crude construction of ether pockets associated with material nuclei and further how we cannot keep from talking perfect nonsense if we meddle with the distinct presentation of time and space einstein has proved the irrelevance of this and all kindred theories and cautions 
by showing that given the fundamental constant all known features of gravitation may be foreseen exactly and calculated numerically from a coherent formula which asks for no mechanical model or diagram nor datum line in time or space and no distinction in kind between them his theory breaks through the dome of many colored glass with which time stains the white radiance of eternity but we do not arrive at a perfectly white radiance something must remain to give us numerical results something akin to ether pockets of specific depth figures in the theory characterizing the presence of matter einstein describes these as a curvature of the space-time medium but i regard this description as otiose it is a return by another road to the concrete from which his mathematics has just liberated him it merely illustrates the indelible character of the mind's preoccupation with the spatial presentation of phenomena if it is the aim to say the last word on gravitation surely that goal is reached when it is shown to be contained in a formula the elements of which do not of necessity bear any interpretable meaning nec fas es propius mortali attingere divos we have reached kant's ding an sich the matter may then be fairly said to lie outside our ken we have been used to speaking of gravitation as an ultimate property of matter einstein's work appears to me to show that it may be involved in the recesses of the nature of things in depths where our senses can never follow it maybe not is other experiences may induce us to accept a definite picture of the constitution of matter and any scheme is possible that can be superposed to the phantom to which einstein's profound dialectic has now reduced gravitation but may i add to recover our breath i am not convinced that the day of usefulness is over for those unpretentious illustrations which take up a subject in the middle and leave off as soon as they are beaten they are like pacemakers in a race it is enough a shrewd man said if a parable goes upon all fours you must not expect it to draggle its tail on the ground as well theories are made for use to lighten the task of the mind in comprehending nature and difficulty is almost as great a fault as crudity if crudity limits their use difficulty on the other hand forbids it it was in the problem of explaining a laboratory experiment that this high aspiring theory which any poet might envy took its rise aberration of light is consistent with an ether which drifts through the body of the earth undisturbed the michelson morley experiment is consistent with an ether which clings to the earth's surface and moves with it naturally each is consistent with other suppositions but where shall we find a supposition that is consistent with both a paradox may require a paradoxical answer and einstein has supplied one put into common language it appears to me to say both phenomena belong to an indeterminate class for they can be reproduced in calculation while employing a fictitious local peculiar time which does not represent all we know but is vitiated by a foreign addition the experiments are oriented so that we have separated ourselves from our ordinary means of standardizing time one suggests that the ether is sweeping through the earth's surface and the other that it is still but in rigor we can draw no conclusion from them in just the same way in geometry if we set out to assign the position of the vertices of the triangle inscribed to one circle and circumscribed to another which upon general grounds we should expect to be definite we might arrive by experiment at apparently conflicting results the explanation is that the data of the problem are peculiar and contrary to anticipation do not involve the complete number of facts required for a determinate result it must not be supposed that we are tied by necessity to experiments that prove to be inconclusive in principle the finite velocity of light was discovered from observations of jupiter's satellites 
by just one of those repetitive processes upon which I have laid stress. Römer examined the period intervening between successive eclipses of satellite one at different points of the Earth's orbit. It then appeared that the average was less when the Earth was approaching Jupiter than when they were separating from one another. I have never heard of any explanation of this fact except that the Earth's velocity in its orbit anticipates the receipt of the light pulse in the former case and defers it in the latter. The velocity inferred is, in fact, treated in a modern discussion as a method of determining the dimensions of the Earth's orbit. With modern observations of the moment of eclipse, extending over twenty-five years or so, and thus introducing plenty of repetitions in all the circumstances, the degree of certainty arrived at by this velocity method is rough, by astronomical standards, but far from negligible. The value of the solar parallax is in close agreement with that found by more purely geometrical methods, such as the position of the planet Eros, with a probable error of one part in four hundred. Ten times as great a precision would be wanted before we could definitely distinguish by these means a relative velocity of transmission c from one of value c plus minus u, where c is the velocity of light, terrestrially determined, and u is the velocity of the earth in its orbit, but in principle I presume that we could do so. I suppose that the result, as far as it goes, would allow a transmission of light across space, which falsified Newtonian axioms of relative velocity, as it certainly allows one that agrees with them. But if the relativist desires the former scheme, I must leave to his ingenuity to describe the associated geometry and time system that he would employ, as I profess myself unable to imagine them. His device of local time seems to me completely excluded by the repetitions. There is a passage in Gibbon's autobiography which has always interested me. Speaking of his mathematical studies, As soon as I understood the principle, I relinquished forever the pursuit of mathematics, nor can I lament that I desisted before my mind was hardened by the habit of rigid demonstration so destructive of the finer feeling of moral evidence, which must, however, determine the actions and opinions of our lives. There may be some malice in that, possibly Gibbon was thinking of some dear friend when he wrote it. But we cannot deny that it conveys a salutary reminder. Mathematics no less than other aids to thought lives in a world where actuality is bartered for convenience. We must recognize the risk we take if we follow it. It may carry us farther than we are entitled to go. As time extends knowledge, it extends equally the unknown. We must be content to read the new page as we read the old, with our fingertips like a blind man, not knowing what comes next. I have the privilege this evening of speaking under the protection of Halley's genial name. Halley was a learned mathematician, and he was a great humanist, a man of strong practical sense. We owe to him the production of Newton's Principia. Our obligation to his common sense, to say the least, in getting it done, is probably greater than we shall ever know. In praising common sense today, I would not seem to withhold any term of admiration for the genius which has for the first time proved capable of rehandling Newton's gravitation, and has given us the bold, new, subtle, soaring theory of relativity. But as for myself, I have thought right in addressing you to endeavour to show that we may, if we please, continue to keep our feet upon this earth. End of On Gravitation and Relativity The Philosophy of Animal Colors by Dr. Andrew Wilson Originally published in Knowledge, an illustrated magazine of science, plainly worded, exactly described, 1881. Part 1. There is a suggestive passage in Butler's Hudibras, which maintains that, 
fools are known by looking wise as men find woodcocks by their eyes and if the axiom be correct that a poet is only great when he is true to nature it must be admitted that butler has been singularly felicitous in this metaphor whoever has seen a woodcock in its ordinary summer plumage may form a good idea of the truth of the poetic remark as that bird moves about amongst the fallen leaves of autumn the greys and browns and yellows of its feathers mingle so beautifully with the like tints of its surroundings that the animal is absolutely concealed from any view but the practised eye of the sportsman as has been remarked of the bird in question even the very conspicuous and ornamental tail becomes hidden from view in a most singular fashion below these tail feathers exhibit a white colour tinted with a silver sheen and marked with a deep black nothing more conspicuous than such an ornament can well be imagined yet the tail and its belongings are nevertheless wonderfully concealed for as the bird reposes these underlines and tints are placed downwards and above the ashen grey tints mingle perfectly with the bird's surroundings as the woodcock therefore rests amid its background of wood and its foreground of fallen leaves every line of its plumage is made to assimilate so closely with the objects around that the bird's presence even a short distance off is not suspected the woodcock is by no means alone in this harmony betwixt its plumage and its surroundings the sand grouse of the deserts for instance exhibit a like harmony these birds cannot be detected even as they run amidst the sand of their haunts so closely imitated in the dull tints of their plumage is the tone of the desert wild the well-known case of the ptarmigan is even more extraordinary still in summer the bird shows a plumage of pearly grey which conceals it perfectly as it lies on its bed of scottish heather mingled with the lichen and its kith and kin but when the winter snows descend and coat the hillsides with a mantle of white then a kindly nature still contrives concealment for the ptarmigan in a fresh suit of colour the pearly greys of the summer are replaced by a plumage of snowy whiteness and save for its dark eye there is little risk of the discovery of the bird by the unwary or unpractised sportsman the grouse and common partridge are not less perfectly protected the hues of the grouse match the tints of the heather and the partridge is almost as difficult to discover say in a ploughed field as the ptarmigan on the hillside the birds just mentioned are all rossorial birds that is they are allied to the type of the common fowl and are typically ground livers their tints therefore assimilate with those of the ground and with ground vegetation and whatever may be the ultimate philosophy which shows the origin of such harmonies it is very plain that the utilitarian is bound to read protection in every line of the story escape from their enemies must be favored by the correspondence in color to which we allude the harmonies of color present the safest and therefore the best foil to the keenness of sight of the eagle and to the agility of the falcon and its kind it is different indeed with the songsters of the wood and grove with well-developed powers of flight and with a close refuge amid the foliage of the wood the appearance of bright hues and tints in these birds is by no means disadvantageous another law that of the development of color in relation to sex has taken precedence of the regulation of color as a means of protection if concealment be necessary nature will teach the art of hiding in other ways than that whereby she contrives to make the partridge face danger with a stillness that almost rivals that of the stones trustful in the harmony of her plumage that so closely matches her heather bed but there are wider fields open to the naturalist survey of color and its meanings suppose that we peer for a moment into the class of fishes we shall find the adaptation of color to surroundings illustrated in a very apt degree whoever has tried to spear a sole or flounder for example well knows that the excitement of the sport consists in the endeavor to follow out the axiom of mrs glass and on the principle which that worthy lady laid down about first catching your hair to first catch your flounder you cautiously and slowly paddle out to shallow water in your punt and you drift over the flat sandy beach at a depth of from two to three feet below the water is as clear as crystal here and there you see a lazy starfish on the march exerting himself to the utmost as he slowly extends ray after ray and crawls at the rate of about a mile a month or so by aid of his hundreds of sucker feet the sand eels annoy you as they burrow downwards and send up little clouds of dust on your approach 
but the flounders you came to spear where are they an echo seems but to answer where but the practiced sportsman bids you learn as in all other sciences and arts the first lesson namely how to see and observe as your boat creeps along he points to what seems a mere sandy lump but in which his keener eye has detected the merest wriggle of a fin dash goes the spear and up comes a flounder and as you watch the ground you see dozens it may be of similar sandy patches swimming off in rapid alarm the flounder's back it is really the side of the fish on which it lies is white enough as we know but the other side is as close a representation of a sandy patch as you can see or as you can imagine small wonder then that in flounder spearing you experience the difficulties which nature throws in the way of capture through likeness and color to the animal surroundings it is the same with sole turbot and with the skates and angelfishes watch the first flounder you see resting on the sandy bed of the aquarium tank and you will receive ample proof of the truth of the foregoing remarks and should you chance to see the lazy monk or angelfish as it lies prone heavy and indolent in the highest degree in the flow of its tank you may again understand something of the value of color as a means of protection to animal life in the case of those queer fishes the little seahorses or hippocampi with heads like horses and with a body which at large reminds one most forcibly of some figure from the herald's college on a crest concealment is effected in a slightly different fashion from that prevalent among the souls here the body as a rule possesses long streamers or fringes that mimic the seaweeds so that as the animal reposes its body may well enough represent a stone to which are attached fragments of marine vegetation the australian seahorses which live among red seaweeds have streamers of that hue attached to their bodies and the mimicry and imitation of their surroundings are thus very complete even their near neighbors the pipe fishes with green bodies when they fasten themselves to some fixed object and loll in the water may closely resemble an inert piece of green weed amongst even the highest animals protective coloring is common a lion's hue matches the sand as a tiger's stripes according to mr wallace imitate very closely the foliage and trees amidst which it crouches the camel's coat is sandy like its desert and the rabbits offer as plain examples as any of the color harmony in question the polar bear is white like the arctic fox in winter dress and the nocturnal rats and moles are dressed in shades the opposite of the ghost-like hues that become so conspicuous at night part two but descending to still lower grades of life we may discover examples of this mimicry not only of surroundings but also of lifeless or inorganic objects and of it may be plant structures as well on the part of animals the so-called stick insects or walking twigs as they are often called the phasmidae of the naturalist present us with the most perfect reproductions of bits of dried twigs a figure of one of these insects is before me as i write it is represented climbing on the delicate branch of a shrub and but for the expectation of what one is looking for there would be considerable difficulty in determining which is insect and which plant the bodies of these twig insects which belong by the way to the orthoptera or that order which harbors the familiar crickets and grasshoppers are represented by mere lines the wings have disappeared and it has been remarked that in their gait these insects exhibit a peculiar habit of using their legs in a singularly awkward fashion and thus apparently aid the illusion of the spectator that he is regarding a dried twig moved erratically by the wind more extraordinary still are the leaf insects near allies indeed of the walking sticks here mimicry of the plant proceeds so far as to fully justify the eminent naturalist's remarks that it is strange to find the animal assuming a mimetic disguise and aping the actor's art the wing in the leaf insects exactly imitate leaves the venation or arrangement of the veins in the leaf is clearly seen and in one form phylum even the chest and legs of the animal assume leaf-like characters when such an insect rests amid foliage the value of such a close resemblance to its plant surroundings as a means of protection can be readily understood in some leaf insects all of which are tropical species 
the wings resemble leaves that are dried and withered. In others, the minute fungi that attack leaves are imitated. Mr. A. R. Wallace tells us that one of the walking sticks obtained by him in Borneo was covered over with foliaceous excrescences of a clear olive-green color, so as exactly to resemble a stick grown over by a creeping moss or juggermania. The Dyak who brought it me assured me it was grown over with moss, though alive, and it was only after a most minute examination that I could convince myself it was not so. Lastly, there may be noticed, in connection with these curious traits of animal life, the fact that certain animals, themselves harmless and inoffensive, may assume the exact appearance of offensive neighbors. In this respect, certain butterflies are facile prancite. Certain South American butterflies, known collectively under their family name of Heliconidae, exhibit a brilliant coloration, but likewise possess a very strong odor, and it may be presumed from the sequel a highly disagreeable taste as well. They are highly conspicuous insects, and the undersides of their wings are as brilliantly colored as the upper surfaces, so that, even in repose, and when resting with the wings apposed over the back, they are readily enough seen. Their colors are prominent, not to say gaudy. Yellows, reds, and whites commingle with blacks, blues, and other tints in a striking fashion. They are further by no means rapid flyers and putting the foregoing circumstances of their gaudy color and their slow movements together, no group of animals would seem more liable to the attacks of bird enemies than these helicon butterflies. Yet the reverse is the case. So far from being decimated, their race flourishes apace, and this result is clearly due to the strong odor and nauseous taste they possess. The mere touch of a helicon is in itself a pungent matter which reminds one of nothing so much as the persistence of the muskrat's secretion, or the still more awful effluvium of the American skunk. Their neighbor butterflies may fall victims by the score to the rapacity of their feathered enemies, but the helicons are spared from even the semblance of attack. So far there seems nothing unusual or striking in a group of butterflies being protected through strong odor and worse taste from their natural enemies the birds. But now comes the most curious phase of this history. Another and distinct family of butterflies, known as the Leptilidae, allied to the common white cabbage butterfly and removed from the helicons, also possesses representatives in South America. There are no points of agreement between the Leptilidae's and the helicons, save indeed that both are butterflies. Furthermore, the Leptilidae's are entirely destitute of the nauseous odor and of the strong taste of the helicons, and in respect of their more agreeable presence should become a prominent article, as do other butterflies, in the bill of fare of the birds. Yet strangely enough, the Leptilidae's escape persecution, and their reason is not far to seek or difficult to find. When they are carefully examined, certain species of the Leptilidae's are seen to be exact facsimiles in color and appearance of the stinking helicons. Naturalists at first class both as helicons until a closer examination showed the difference between these butterflies, and likewise proved that the Leptilidae's had thus mimicked in the plainest possible manner the colors of their strong-smelling neighbors. Nor are the colors alone imitated. The very shape of the helicon's wings is reproduced in those of the Leptilidae's, and the feelers likewise mimic those of the former group. Again, special forms of Leptilidae's mimic special forms of helicons. The flight has become of similar character in both species, and the habits have also been slavishly copied. Such instances as these certainly represent food for thought to the reflective mind. It is the business of philosophy to account for facts by placing the facts in scientific juxtaposition. Philosophy in this light is the thread upon which the pearls of knowledge are strung. What then, it may be asked, is the philosophy which can explain the curious resemblances seen in the animal world, ranging from, say, a mere likeness in tint to the surroundings, as in the flounder or woodcock, through more intensified likenesses, to the exact mimicry and to the slavish copy of color and form, as in the butterflies. A first and highly important feature in the consideration of the case is found in the fact that there is a gradation in the degree of mimicry from the mere sand or ground tinting of the flounder to the exact coloring of the butterflies 
is of course a wide step but it is one which is bridged over by intermediate examples and stages then secondly we discover a purpose or use in the disguises that purpose apart from any considerations of its origin being the protection of the animal from its enemies and the consequent good and increase of its race thirdly it appears possible to account for these curious transformations and disguises by finding an initial step it is the old story of le premier pas qui coûte applied to natural history research and this first step is found in the solid axiom that every living species is liable to variation and change next succeeds the consideration that such varieties as are produced have to struggle for existence suppose a number of white varieties produced in a cold snowy region along with varieties of more conspicuous colors it is evident that whilst the white varieties would escape from their enemies the darker colored individuals would succumb thus the white race comes to the front and holds its own and its perpetuation and increase becomes a matter of surety summing up the argument we find that two factors are at work in bringing about these wonderful color likenesses in the animal world the one is variation producing the color varieties the other is the circumstances of life which weed out the weak and give the battle to the strong which latter are those whose colors best suit their surroundings this is the philosophy which natural history today lays down for our acceptance nay more it is a philosophy which explains far more important facts of life than mere mimicry it is evolution and development reduced to their plainest and fundamental terms in a word darwinism in a nutshell as illustrated by the variation and change that all life knows and by the warring of that life bringing the best of its units to the front of the battle end of the philosophy of animal colors by Dr. Andrew Wilson.